Welcome to Prophecy Countdown with author and pastor Kenneth Baer. Join us every week for the latest updates on what the Bible has to say about the events, the characters, and prophetic signs of the return of Jesus Christ and His coming kingdom. Make sure you not only subscribe, but like your favorite episodes and share it with your friends. Service, now, we are on with the, the broadcast. Gospel of Matthew. Today we'll be starting chapter 10 of Matthew. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. Uh, the topic of my message today is called the, the Twelve. The sending of the Twelve. The sending of the Twelve. And we read the first four verses to you. Uh, you can follow along on the screen or in your, in your bulletins, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, again, Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So this is the, the complete listing of the, the twelve uh, the 12 apostles. You know, this is the only place that they're called in the entire Bible uh, that they're called the apostles. Usually they're just referred to as the 12, as the 12. Now that gives us an idea that the naming of these, these 12, that the fact that they would be 12, um, indicates there's a similarity there, at least in, from, from a number perspective, of the 12 tribes of Israel. Were the 12 apostles picked to be 12 because there were 12 tribes of Israel? Well, it, it very well could be. There's a few instances in the Bible uh, that the 12 are listed right along with the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, now, what's interesting with these, these 12 apostles, what do they have in common? Well, first of all, they were pretty common men. Most of them were relatively unlearned, uh, possibly with the exception of Matthew, uh, the tax collector. Matthew, the tax collector, um, uh, not only is, does he have a gospel uh, with his name on it as well, uh, but historians tell us, early church historians tell us, uh, that Matthew, because he was a tax collector, also tended to have a high degree of, of proficiency, not only in languages, but also in numbers as well probably a very well educated. And we see this also in the Gospel of Matthew uh, because Matthew is able to quote uh, the Hebrew scriptures as well. Uh, now what's interesting is that these, these 12 men uh, were, were relatively common men. And, and quite frankly, that gives me a, a great hope. Uh, because I'm kind of a, a common guy. I'm, I'm more of a pizza and beer guy rather than a champagne and flaming duck uh, kind of guy. I'm a, I'm a, I come from a middle class family, uh, middle class town, middle class wages. I, I like middle class people and yet God called me to, to be a pastor. And it's been my privilege to serve as a pastor for over 20 years. And, and again, I take a look at these disciples, these, these 12, and they were they were middle class people. You know, Jesus could have easily gone to some of the, the great rabbinical schools uh, that were available in, in uh, Israel at the time. Uh, we know, for example, uh, in fact today, even the name survives, Hillel. Hillel is, was a school of learning that, that flourished from uh, 1 BC to 2 or 3 AD. Uh, it, was, it was started by a man named Hillel, and it was a great uh, school of learning. Um, the, the, the very, very uh, highest senior ranking Sadducees and Pharisees often had attended uh, the Hillel school. And they were, they were very, very uh, educated, uh, not only in Hebrew, but also in, in, in Jewish mysticism and, and Jewish literature uh, that existed at the time. Uh, the House of Hillel um, uh, had, had, had a, a fine job of not only educating disciples and, and rabbis, uh, but also promoting uh, Jewish customs and Jewish rabbinical literature as well. Uh, now, in the Acts of the Apostles, we have, uh, we have Paul. And, and Paul wasn't educated under Hillel. He was educated under what was Gamaliel. Uh, Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was one of the, 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 uh, the finest teachers um, of Jewish rabbinical thought uh, and the Hebrew scriptures uh, in all of Israel. 
And Paul comes along and he is a, a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were highly educated. But notice that Jesus didn't pick the Pharisees. Other than Paul, these 12, none of them were Pharisees. Uh, they were common, ordinary men. They were, they were fishermen. And again, uh, Paul references this in, in 1 Corinthians. This is what Paul has to say. He says, For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of, of noble birth. And that, like I said, this is important because Jesus takes the ordinary and makes it special. There's a, there's a saying that God doesn't necessarily call the prepared, but God prepares the call. You know, the calling of God is the most significant thing in anyone's life. It, it really is. I remember uh, when I was a, a young man and I had just gotten saved and uh, came to the Lord and I really felt uh, that God was calling me to ministry. And I went to see my pastor and I told him that I was, this was a dilemma because I was still paying off my college loans and I was working um, in a secular job. And the pastor was very, very good. He was very, very kind to me because he, he told me that, that all of our jobs, God doesn't look at secular versus sacred, that all of our callings, if they're from God, are, are special and they're unique. In fact, he told me the highest calling anyone could have would be to be a mother. Think of it, a mother that, uh, that not only gives birth to her children, but then is charged with the nurturing of her children, to bring them up in, in the ways of the Lord. Uh, so this is, this is exactly how, how I, I think when I read the stories of these, these 12 apostles, of the 12, um, it, my, it fills my heart with, 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 um, with hope. Uh, that God can call any of us. And look what God was able to do through these, these 12 unique men, many of them just fishermen, and all, many from the same area of Galilee. And, and they ch literally changed, changed the world. Uh, and again, this is the only, first and only time that we use this word, the, uh, the apostles. Now, the word apostles is, is, literally means one who is sent out, one who is sent out. Uh, it's like an envoy or an ambassador. Uh, in fact, there, there is a place where uh, where, where Jesus is called the apostle and high priest. So Jesus was also called. He had a mission. God had sent him on a mission. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came as this, this mission. Now, we can go through this list of the 12 and talk about each of the 12, but I think uh, another way of looking at this is, is just kind of in summary. One of the things we see in summary, anytime the 12 are listed, is Peter is always mentioned first. You know, Peter was definitely a leader, along with James and John. Peter, James, and John were in the inner circle, and they were able to, to do and go places with Jesus that the, the others did not have that, uh, that benefit. So Peter's always listed last. Judas is always la listed last. So Peter's first and Judas is last. And then typically uh, the brothers are named together. So uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, uh, they're listed as, as brothers and then the rest of them. Now, this apostolic number of 12, uh, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, is a, is a very, bold, very workable uh, theory uh, when it comes to numerology in the Bible. That number 12 is, is important. Not only were there 12 tribes of Israel, uh, but we see there were 12 fruit. There was a lot of things that were referenced to, to be 12. And that 12 has a reference to completeness, to completeness. So this was uh, these 12 apostles, uh, even though they died out, um, they represented the, the complete uh, idea of Jesus choosing uh, men and women uh, and, and choosing them and sending them out, that they were sent by, by God. So, now where are they to go? Well, in, uh, let's, let's go ahead and read uh, Matthew 5 through 8, which is the second part of my message today, which is uh, the 12. Verse 5 says this, And these twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, uh, freely give. You know, it's, it's interesting, I find it very interesting that Jesus says, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, but do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we see in the Gospels that Jesus was, was, uh, was willing uh, to go into Samaria. 
You know, Jesus uh, tells the parable of the Samaritan. He goes to the city of Samaria where he meets the woman at the well who was a woman of Samaria. Uh, Jesus was willing to cross that barrier. But at the same time, uh, Jesus was called as the Messiah. And that Messiah was somebody that the Jewish people were waiting for. This was the prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures. We find in the New Testament uh, that there's a new covenant. Uh, that Jesus is the Lamb of God, but he's also the bringer of the, the new covenant. And this new covenant is to, to all, without any respect. Paul says there's no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, uh, male nor female. And, and th this is a, a great opportunity for us to be able to take the gospel to the world. It's not just to the Jewish people. Do not go to the way of the Gentiles. This is the pattern also of the gospel. If you remember when we were going through the book of, of Acts, Paul would often travel into a Gentile territory, but he would first go to the synagogue. He would go to the Jews first, and he would preach the kingdom of God. He would preach Jesus to them. And what was the reception? Well, typically, um, there were some that were converted. Usually the men were upset, and the women tended to, to believe Paul. Uh, but this is how the, and then from there, after he shook the dust off of the, from the people in the synagogue, he went on and preached the gospel to the, to the Gentiles. Now, the, we know that the gospel would go to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles, but it had to begin first with the lost sheep of Israel. Because Jesus, again, um, wanted the house of Israel to understand that he was the promised Messiah. Um, even though they had lo lost their Jewish state years before, and they were basically uh, 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 imprisoned or, or ruled by the Romans, uh, Israel still had a national identity. And even though these were Jews, Jews in uh, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin primarily, um, this was still Israel. And Jesus came as the Messiah to the house of, of Israel. Now, what were they to do? It says this, it says, Jesus says in verse 7 and 8, uh, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead, cast out demons. Well, let me tell you, uh, that's quite a job description, isn't it? I mean, you've probably had job descriptions in your jobs before, you know, clean out the trash. I mean, when I was a kid, my mother gave me a, tr a job description, things I had to do every day. When I was working in industry, I had job descriptions from my bosses. I tr crafted job descriptions, but this is quite a, a job description, isn't it? Uh, preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Well, first of all, let me start with this idea of preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, when Jesus first came, Jesus picked up where John the Baptist had left off. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. And what did Jesus come preaching? He's, he came preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here he's telling his disciples to go and preach the kingdom of heaven. And I, and I think that might be interesting if we really take a look at it. You know, Jesus spoke in parables. In fact, in one place in the New Testament, it says, without parables, Jesus did not speak. Now, that's hyperbole, but it basically means that Jesus often spoke through parables. And what do the parables teach us? Well, Jesus said the parables would, would teach us about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And this is exactly why, why Jesus told his disciples to continue what Jesus was doing, was to teach on the kingdom of heaven. You know, often today we wonder about the kingdom of heaven. We know that Jesus came to fulfill the, the, the prophecies of the Old Testament. But we know that there's many prophecies that haven't yet been fulfilled. Um, Jesus came, um, people were very surprised that the Messiah not only came and riding on a donkey, which was fulfilling prophecies, but then within a few days later, he went to the cross and he died. A and this, this surprised, this surprised the disciples, even though Jesus had told them that. There's many f prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled, but when we take a look at the kingdom of heaven, we can say that the kingdom of heaven is, and yet is not yet. There's still something coming in it for the kingdom of heaven. In fact, that's exactly why, um, uh, why I wrote my latest book, which is called uh, uh, The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom, because when we take a look at the end of the age, we understand that it's not only the end of the age, people say it's the end of the earth. No, it's not the end of the world. Um, there's actually, if we, we look at it today, I'm not a date setter, but there's at least seven years left, um, and then we have a thousand year reign of Christ. So we're a long way away from the 
end of the world. But at the same time, the kingdom is now. Uh, the kingdom is now. Jesus comes and can change your heart. Uh, Jesus came so that we could accept who, who he is, that he's the Lamb of God, that he's the Messiah. He suffered and died for our sins. He rose on the third day. He ascended into heaven. He's coming back again. And that changes everything, and it changes our heart, and we can experience the kingdom of heaven, heaven now. Jesus says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. You know, the, the, the disciples had a message to preach, but they also had signs to work. Signs and wonders. You know, there's many people that wonder about wonders. They wonder about wonders. You know, they, they, they wonder whether God's still a wonder-working God. Well, the Bible makes it clear that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we want to be able to basically know that when we, we pray for people, that God can and is willing to, to heal them, even from the point of death, even people that are on their deathbed. Uh, in the book of James, it says, Is anyone sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church. Let him anoint them with oil. And the prayer of the sick will raise the dead. If they've committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. So this, this continues today to be our mission as well. Uh, we don't see wonders. We don't see miracles. And that's by the definition of a wonder and a miracle. Uh, a wonder and a miracle means that it's, that it's not commonplace. It's not something that happens all the time. At the same time, a mature Christian should understand and not dispel people that claim to have been healed, for example, or claim to, for people to, to claim that they've, they've seen a, a, a miracle of some kind, a healing. Uh, we give God all the glory. You know, if, if people are, are, are misleading people and pretending that they're healed when they're not, or an evangelist is pretending to heal when he's not able to, no, no healing is happening, well, that's between him and God. We're going to give God the glory for the ability for, for Jesus to continue to heal. Uh, let, let me close with a, with a, with a story. When I was, when I was uh, a relatively young man, this goes back 30, 35 years ago, um, I, I was in a church with my wife and we had joined this church and it was a relatively small church and, and we liked it. And it was a, a middle class, middle class church. I told you, I, I'm a middle class person. It's this, this, is a, this is a church of, of working families. The, the parking lot was full of trucks, and this is before trucks were cool. These were trucks because these were working men trucks. You know, these, these, these men worked as, as, as laborers, as carpenters, as uh, carpet installers, as electricians, as plumbers, as heavy equipment operators. Uh, they installed insulation. Uh, they worked in basements. They carried lumber. Uh, they were laborers. And this is what our church was, was full of, is these, these working class people. Well, to make a long story short, um, my pastor, even though I was a young man, uh, called me and one of the other men in the church, his name was Denny, uh, into his office. And he told us that he wanted to uh, appoint us, anoint us, as elders in the church. Now this, this confused me, even though I would, had been in the church for a while, I always thought that elders were elderly people. And I was anything but elderly. And he said, no, elders is, a, is an office in the church. And we had a relatively small church. We only had one employee, but the church was growing. And he wanted Denny and I to, to, be, to be elders. And I wasn't quite sure everything that that meant, but one of the things the pastor told me is he showed me James 5, where it says that let, call the elders of the church and let them anoint uh, the sick with oil. Well, sure enough, I had, I had only been an elder for a few weeks, and I get a call from the pastor. And he says, uh, he said, well, Brother Ken, he said, you know Victor, right? And I, I knew Victor. Victor was a roofer. And he said, Victor fell off the roof. And, and it was horrible. And, and it doesn't look like he broke any, bo any bones, but, but he can hardly walk. He's all wrapped up and he's at home. And, you know, if Victor can't work, uh, the family's not going to eat. Uh, Victor doesn't have any insurance. Yeah, I want you to go over to his house. And they gave me the address. And he said, anoint him with oil. Anoint him with oil in the name of Jesus. I said, okay. So I, I went over to, uh, to talk with Victor and his wife, Marie, and uh, they're a lovely couple, lovely couple, but, but Victor was all banged up. He was, he was bruised from head to toe. Um, he had a sling. His arm, was, his arm was okay. His leg had ace bandages around it. Uh, he was sitting without any shoes, and he just, he hurt everywhere. It was amazing that he didn't break anything. And uh, so I said, well, I, I'm here. And he said, oh, Brother Bear, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. He said, uh, I, I just believe Jesus is going to heal me. 
And I said, well, I believe it too, Victor. So again, this was the very first time I didn't know much of what I was doing. I'd seen the pastor uh, use some anointing oil before and put it on their, on their forehead and make a sign of a cross. And, and, it's, and it smelled, it had a fragrance to it, uh, whether it was frankincense or myrrh, I'm not sure what it was, but there was a fragrance to it as well. Uh, but, but I did my job. I, I, I prayed over him. I, I read James 5 uh, and I anointed him. And he said, Brother Bear, it's my leg. You got to anoint my leg. So I, I took the oil out and I anointed his leg. And then his wife came over and she said, you know, she said, she said, uh, uh, Brother Bear, as long as you're here, would you anoint me? Because I've had some horrible pain. I've had some horrible pain. It's very difficult for me to even take care of my kids. So I anointed Maria as well. And, and, and Brother, <laughs> as I was leaving, uh, Victor called me over again. He Said, he said, would you just anoint me again? I just don't feel it. I, I, just, I just believe God's going to heal me, but would you anoint me again? So I, I ended up using about half of a bottle of oil on Victor. And we had a good prayer and I left. And it wasn't that I wasn't expecting anything, uh, but I didn't see anything. Uh, but I believe that that was my job. As an elder of the church, I was supposed to, to pray and believe and anoint the, the sick with oil and, and believe God. Well, you know, what was interesting, that was, that was I think, on a, a Monday morning, or Monday, Monday morning as I got the call, Monday evening, I went and saw Victor and his wife, and we had a Wednesday, remember when churches had Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and, and Wednesday Bible study in the evening? I, I love that. Uh, and, and I was there on Wednesday, and, and I come into the church, and I had to check my kids in downstairs because uh, they were going into their kids' classes. So I, I came into the auditorium, and by this time, a uh, pastor's already calling up Victor, who's there in church, up onto the stage. And Victor has this testimony. He says, oh, I fell off the roof last week, and I thought I was a goner because even though I didn't break any bones, I was, I was hurt and I couldn't move my leg. My arm was in a sling. Uh, my other leg wasn't working. My back had felt like it was broken. And, and Brother Bear came over and anointed with me with oil, and, he, and here I am today. And he gave God the glory. And, you know, I thought, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Here's a, here's a man that, that prayed and believed that God could heal him, and, and God would choose to use somebody like me. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a miracle worker at all. I mean, I can, I can count on one hand the, the two or three times that I have a story like, uh, like the, the story with Victor, where I was able to anoint somebody and see God do miraculous things. But I can tell you this, is that if, that you're, if you're sick, I'll anoint you with oil. Uh, if you call me to pray, I will pray and I'll believe that God is still a wonder-working God and God accompl can accomplish something wonderful in your life because God still heals to this day. That was the commission that Jesus gave his disciples. He said, I want you to go heal the sick, preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, heal the sick. He wanted them to, to believe that God is the same yesterday today and forever. And that healing of power is still available to us today. So let me pray. Father God, I want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. Author and pastor Kenneth Baer's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including the Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today. Thank you for joining us on Prophecy Countdown with Pastor Ken Baer. Don't leave without first sharing the latest episode with your friends. Be sure to join us again for the latest updates on Prophecy Countdown.